Now broadcasting from his hidden bunker and fully stocked bar, it is the Saturday Report with Colt Sebastian Taylor. Hello, my friends, and welcome to the Saturday Report with me, Colt Sebastian Taylor, adventurer, entrepreneur, and amateur dog dad. Welcome to the Saturday Report. Uh, apologies for being a little late on the report uh, this week. Uh, it being published on Sunday. Uh, just to let you know, uh, I'm perfectly okay about being lazy, but uh, I had to take my uh, lovely boxer to the vet on Friday. Um, and it uh, turns out she had fleas. And so spent all day Friday and Saturday um, defleeing her and the house, uh, my compound. And so, you know, I had to, uh, had to take care of it. I had to take care of my buddy. So uh, apologies about that, but uh, I'm here. For Saturday Report, Sunday, but still the Saturday Report. So let's get started with the report today. But before we get to our first story, I want to give a shout out, my friends, to the Loving 13 Boutique. They are a fantastic group of people. In fact, they were a uh, a sponsor sponsor of last week's Long Shots D&D. And I said, you know what? You guys are so nice. I'm going to give you a shout out on my program as well. The Loving 13 Boutique is a Kentucky-born uh, and is inspired by a passion for fashion at affordable prices. They are committed to providing a boutique chic experience. Uh, they've traveled the world on the modeling side of the business, but now their mission is to assist you, my friends, in achieving an individual style that you love they're a family-owned, face-based business looking forward to providing the experience you deserve. So check out their their fantastic website with loads, loads of things to look at at loving13boutique.shop. And if you use the code loving13friend, you'll get $10 off a $50 purchase. It's pretty fantastic. And uh, yeah, I'll put the link in the post below. Be sure to check them out. Tell Tell them that Colt Sebastian Taylor sent you. You won't get anything special, but it'll be funny if that gets back to me. So check them out, my friends, at loving13boutique.shop. First up, my friends, we go to crime in Florida. No, I'm not talking about the governor, who's a crime that he's still in office. No, I'm talking about theft from, uh, from a liquor distributor, actually. So I occasionally enjoy, uh, you know, I come across stories about people stealing booze. I like a little bit of drinky drinky myself, but these folks, boy howdy, they like to drink a drink. They stole $1.6 million worth of alcohol from a distribution company that carries such brands as Malibu and Jose Cuervo. Uh, burglars use tractor trailers, tractor trailers, uh, in July. This story is just coming up on July 8th at the Republic National Distribution D Distributing Company. Uh, in Hillsborough County, south of Tampa, uh, according to a newly unsealed search warrant that was obtained by news organizations on October 5th, uh, between 4.10 a.m. and 9.45 a.m., thieves removed 4,277 cases of liquor from the company um, from that uh, from the Frenzia Wines and Sutter Home Winery um, as well, according to a search warrant that was looking for an Apple iPhone Pro Max. Investigators believe that the probable cause that the phone contained specific information, technical data, and evidence showing that the burger lane grand theft took place. I can only imagine folks were likely taking selfies and chatting back and forth about it. Um, the, uh, the, it's located in Gibson, Florida. It is one of the largest wine and distribution wine Largest wine and spirits distributors, dis distributors with 14,000 employees in 38 states and Washington, D.C., according to the company's website. So the, um, the, the company, the Republic National Distributing Company, one of the biggest in the, in the country, has people all over the place. According to Vice President of Corporate Communications, released a statement after the um, search warrant was unsealed, Quote, while we are unable to comment at this time because this is an active law enforcement investigation, we have confidence that the law enforcement is handling this matter seriously and taking all necessary steps to find the perpetrators of this crime. 
Um, the surveillance video of nearby businesses and convenience store was able to identify the use of tractor trailers in the burglary. And then they found additional surveillance footage uh, of the tractor trailer storage facility showing the three tractor trailers were used to remove cases of alcohol. So three tractor trailers of booze stolen from this in July. And now they're looking for a very specific cell phone to prove that they, the criminals, probably haven't drank it all day by now. Probably, they're, probably, they're probably gonna be caught. Probably gonna be caught. So, fellas, might whoever whoever is like the least amount of a drinker, you might want to cut a deal. Yes, my friends, we go to the world of entertainment where Michael Caine has announced he is finally retiring from acting. Um, you may know him from hit movies like The Dark Knight, The Italian Job. Uh, but, uh, he is now finally retiring. Uh, his last movie is called The Great Escaper, where he plays a World War II vet escaping a nursing home to go back to Normandy during his celebrations. Um, but he said during a BBC Radio 4 interview, quote, I keep saying I'm going to retire. Well, I am now. Uh, he went on to say, I've played the lead and it's gotten incredible role reviews, talking about his latest movie. The only parts I'm going to get now are old men, 90-year-old men, or maybe 85, you know. And I thought, well, I might as well leave with all this. I've got wonderful reviews. What am, what am I going to do to beat this? Um, so he stars alongside Glenda Jackson, playing Bernard Jordan, a 90-year-old who absconds from a care home to attend the 70th anniversary of of the D-Day landings, based on a true story, based on a true story, and, uh, yeah, so he's retiring, he is a, he has had a long, long career, uh, began acting on stage in the 1950s, made his movie debut in 1956, um, he, uh, he was originally called Maurice, uh, Joseph Micklewhite Jr., before he, uh, he adopted the name, uh, Michael Kine, and then made it his legal name. He's played secret agents, playboys, adventurers, school teachers, and killers. Uh, he portrayed the British spy Harry Palmer in five films, with fame coming after his first stint in the role in the 1965 thriller The Ipcris File. Uh, he was a uh, promiscuous chauffeur in the 1966 romantic comedy Alfie. Uh, he was received his first Academy Award for a supporting role in the Woody Allen film Hannah and Her Sisters, and a second for the 1999 film Cider House Rules. Um, he was uh, starred along uh, Sean Connery in 1975's The Man Who Be King. Good movie. He played a Viet, Viet a journalist in Vietnam in Graham Greene's The Quiet American in 2002. And of course, a lot of people know him as Alfred Pennyworth during the Batman with Christian Bale series. Uh, he was made a commander of the Order of the British Empire in 1993 and knighted in 2000. Some other awards he has received. Uh, he received Best Actor nominations uh, in uh, 66, 72, and 83 for Alfie Sleuth and Educating Rita, and then Best Actor again for The Quiet American in 2002. Uh, he's been nominated for um, various BAFTA awards, uh, Best Actor in a Leading Role, winning with Educating Rita in 1983, uh, and then also some of his other uh, movies. Well, I've, actually, I've already mentioned all these. Uh, the Icarus File, Alfie, The Honorary Consul, Hannah and Her Sisters, Little Voice, Sirehouse Wolves, and The Quiet American. Uh, nominated for a number of Golden Globe awards, uh, winning for Educating Rita, Jack the Ripper and Little Voice, Screen Actors Guild Award for Sire House Rules in 1999, and then a variety of other uh, awards throughout the year. So, very famous Michael Kine, Michael Kine, well known for his uh, cockney accent, uh, very, very long and storied career. Um, other, other movies you should check out The Original Italian Job in 1969, The Battle of Britain. Uh, Zulu, 1964, uh, A Bridge Too Far, that was a good one. Uh, he was also in The Muppets Ca Christmas Carol, great one, great one, you should definitely check that out. Uh, he was in uh, Miss Congeniality, just to name some of these uh, other ones. He was in The Prestige, good one. Children of Men, another good one. 
uh, Inception. Uh, he was he was he's in a lot of um, uh, a lot of uh, Christopher Nolan movies. Obviously, uh, he was in the first Kingsman, The Secret Service. So, uh, yeah, uh, plenty of movies to uh, pick from. From his first on-screen appearance, uncredited in 1950, to his last movie, The Great Escaper, in 2023. That is 73 years of being on film. Over 130 films. Pretty amazing stuff. So uh, be sure to check out some of Michael Caine's wonderful movies. Also, some terrible ones. He was in a Jaws movie. <laughs> but check it out. Um, it is, he's a great actor, his last movie, apparently, I uh, think very good reviews, I'll probably check it out, but Michael Caine, retiring from acting at the age of 90. Moving on to entertainment and crime, as you may remember in past broadcasts, I, um, talked about the South Carolina lawyer that killed his family and was involved in, uh, various other crimes. Well, guess what? He's getting a Lifetime movie. Yes, Lifetime is putting out a movie uh, about Alex Murdoch and his and his murders and whatnot. And guess who's playing him? Bill Pullman. Yes, Bill Pullman from Independence Day is going to be playing the South Carolina lawyer that scammed money through his law practice and um, then committed double homicide. Uh, but uh, the, the, Murdoch, the Murdoch murders the movie it is the 500th original Lifetime movie from that network, which is amazing to me that there's so many of those. According to Tia Magini, uh, Lifetime's uh, Senior Vice President of Scripted Content, uh, Murdoch is an anomaly, anomaly because it was so big uh, in terms of social media and various other, uh, various other uh, things with it. Um, Lifetime is well known of this Lifetime movie. Uh, it's at, and it's been around since nineteen like nineteen ninety. Um, these sort of Lifetime true movies. Uh, it was around before the podcasts and TikTok and like these cr cr true crime podcasts. Lifetime movies have been there since the very beginning. Um, but but you know they've had a lot of competition now. Now these these miniseries on HBO. Netflix, FX, uh, 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 you know, c trying to get attention uh, with these true crime documentaries and miniseries. Uh, but uh, Lifetime even got an Emmy nomination, uh, ranging from uh, Coco Chanel, starring Shirley MacLaine, and Taken From Me, the Tiffany Rubin story uh, with a Tarja, uh, Tar, 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 oh boy, Tarraji. P. Henson. I think I'm saying that name incorrect. Um, according to the vice president, quote, we reach for the stars, but it's hard to compete with Kate Blanchett in a limited series that costs 40 times our budget. So they have a hard time competing with these ones, but they're still pounding them out, pounding them out. Uh, but, but uh, with that said, with that said, uh, the average viewership of the Lifetime original movies have grown uh, by 7% among the network's target audience, which is women between the ages of 25 and 64, uh, compared to the last year at the same time, uh, the broader audience for Lifetime's original movies has increased 16% to 776,000 total viewers. According to Elaine Fontaine Bryant, the executive vice president and head of program for Lifetime, Lifetime Movie Network, and A&E, uh, we know that what our women want to come and see. Uh, Lifetime, you may not know, puts, produces 40 to 50 original movies a year and also acquires finished movies to schedule at least one premiere a week. The originals include Holiday Fair, Juicy Music biop, Biopics, biop, Bios, Unauthorized Celebrity Sagas, uh, and partnerships with famous women, including a recent movie, inspired by the relationship, drama, and Mary J. Blige's songs. So, uh, pretty, pretty, pretty amazing stuff there. The Lifetime, they, 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 they put out a lot of content. An impressive amount of content at a pretty good, <laughs> at a pretty good, at a pretty good rate. At a pretty good rate. So, the Murdoch Murders, 
um, is coming um, soon. Uh, Lifetime began filming as soon as the guilty verdict came in, and uh, they're going to put it out. I think it's a two. I think it's a two-part series. Uh, Bill Pullman signed on to star it last May. Um, he had ten days to prepare for the script, study police and courtroom videos, and get his southern accent in shape before stepping onto the film set in Canada. Uh, the actor wrapped his scenes by June thirtieth, just before the Guild uh, Actors Guild went on strike. So he just 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 got in. So he signed May twenty second. He had ten days to study. So that means he was on set in June June first June second. And knocked it out in one month. <laughs> pretty, pretty. Hey, listen, pretty good. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. Um, so uh, will I watch it? Probably not. I don't watch Lifetime movies, but from a production value, very impressive that this is the five hundredth Lifetime movie. Bill Pullman. I've seen. I'm looking at a picture of him right now, and boy, howdy, he looks. He looks a lot like this guy. <laughs> so. We'll see. I'm sure they'll get pretty good ratings. Bill Pullman, I'm glad he's getting work. Um, but uh, the two-part Saturday and Sunday nights coming up. Not sure of the date, but if you love Lifetime movies, you can watch the 500th Lifetime movie, The Murdoch Murders, the movie. My friends, as you know, I love playing Dungeons & Dragons. Do one every Wednesday on Twitch. I uh, should definitely check it out. But listen, I didn't just fall into that, doing it myself and whatnot. To just like, oh, I want to be on Twitch. I started somewhere learning how to play D&D online. All right? Because it's hard to get together a group of people in person on a reliable basis. Trust me, it's really, really hard. But getting online lets you connect with all these different people all over the world, all over the country. And the first place I went... When I started playing Dungeons & Dragons online, is to Trixie's Tavern. Where is this? How can I get there? Is there a cover charge? Do, is there going to be goblins there? Maybe. But Trixie's Tavern is an interdimensional space for Dungeons & Dragons. If you're looking for a place to find D&D games from players, from beginners to intermediaries to experts, like I was a beginner... No, I'm an expert. Um, you can check her out and pop into the game and enjoy yourself for some high quality D and D. You can they now they're paid to play games, fifteen dollars per player per session. And let me tell you, my folks, goes a long way. These people spend all week putting together a game for you. Okay, it's it takes time. You're you're paid. For, listen. If you're going to go see a show, you don't see movies for free, do you? You sure don't. So, you know, that money helps you create them create a great experience. And listen, they're not they're not hacks. They are fantastic. They are a great time. And they have their Discord channel as well. You can pop in there, role play in chats. That's the you do it anytime you want to. Meet people, bounce ideas off each other. It is just a fantastic place. I'm there. I don't pop in as much as I, I would like to. Pretty busy, but I'm there. You can say hello to me. Tell them that Cole Sebastian Taylor sent you, and you can pop in there and see what's going on. If you're the if you're a first-time player, it's amazing. If you're a seasoned expert, it's amazing as well. You will find something you can really sink your teeth into at Trixie's Tavern. Go to trixiestavern.com. Sign up for a game today. Tell, tell Trixie herself that her favorite redhead, Colt Sebastian Taylor, sent you. And my friends, have a fantastic adventure. You'll, you'll do great. Just like, don't try to, don't try to run across a rope on a huge chasm, because that's very hard to do. Hi, DC. So check out Trixie's Tavern.com. Thanks, my friends. We go to cars, specifically Ferrari in Milan. Ferrari announced this week it will start accepting cryptocurrency to pay for their luxury sports cars in the United States. Uh, following them trying this out in Europe and actually, it, I guess, going well. Um, and, uh, yeah, I guess people have built their fortunes in cryptocurrency. Most of them were jerks. Uh, but now they're going to use their newfound fake wealth to buy Ferraris. Most blue chip companies have steered away from cryptocurrency because it's volatile. It's super, super volatile. And uh, also, there's very high energy usage to make them. Like, it's, it's not... For, for a bunch of fake stuff, 
chews up a lot of energy. Chews up a lot of energy, and there's practically no regulation to it whatsoever. Now, Tesla used to accept cri cryptocurrency uh, for their cars, but that stopped in 2021. Um, when Elon Musk was concerned about the environment caused by cryptocurrency uh, mining. Uh, Ferrari's chief marketing and commercial officer, in Nick, in, in Enrico Galera, uh, told Reuters that cryptocurrency had made efforts to reduce their carbon footprint through the introduction of new software and a larger use of renewable sources. Our target to reach carbon neutrality by 2023, along our whole value chain, is absolutely confirmed. Uh, Ferrari said the decision came after uh, many people requested to pay in cryptocurrency. He said in a statement, some of our young investors who have built their fortunes around cryptocurrency, some others are more traditional investors who want to diversify their portfolios. Uh, now, some cryptocurrencies uh, have improved their energy efficient. Uh, Bitcoin is still attracts criticism for being energy mining intensive. Uh, Ferrari shipped more than 1,800 cars to uh, the Americas, including the United States, in the first half of this year. Uh, Ferrari doesn't know, didn't say how many cars they expect to sell with using cryptocurrency, but uh, they wanted to test out to see if there was a market for it also in the United States. Uh, the Italian company sold more than 13,000 cars in 2022 with a starting price of basically $211,000, upwards of to over $2 million. It's crazy. And um, yeah, their, their largest, their largest um, area to sell cars is from, is to the, Europe, Middle East, and Africa region, um, which counts for 46% of total car shipments in the first half of this year. So, I guess, I guess that's, I guess that's a thing now. So, if you have made millions and not lost everything due to hacks with cryptocurrency, you can apparently, in the United States, start buying cars using cryptocurrency. In other money news, you may have thought yesterday that I didn't post an episode because I won the Powerball $1.76 billion. Sadly, I did not. <laughs> Someone in California stole my jackpot, matching all five numbers in a Powerball, winning $1.76 billion, I believe the second biggest jackpot of all time. And, um... They'll be getting probably a lump sum payment of seven, $774.1 million uh, before taxes. And so about, you know, 40% of that will go to taxes. But uh, if you're listening in California and you just won that money, my friend, I want you on the show. And then I would like you to perhaps kick me $10 million. That'd be really, really, really swell. Because you got you so much. You got so much. I'll name the show after you. So, so... Listen, if you're listening, just just tweet me, just tweet me, just tweet on over here, and uh, we'll we'll figure something out. We now go to the world of art, specifically the Mona Lisa, one of the world's most famous paintings, and uh, apparently Mona Lisa has given up another secret, um, using X-rays to peer into the chemical structure of a tiny speck of the celebrated work. Uh, scientists apparently have found out that uh, got kind of new information about the techniques used by Leonardo da Vinci used to paint this groundbreaking portrait of a woman with a with a very unique little little smile. According to research published by the Journal of American Chemical Society, uh, suggests that the famous uh, famously curious, learned, inventive Italian Renaissance master may have been in a very experimental mood when he began to paint the Mona Lisa in the early 16th century. The oil paint recipe that Leonardo used as his base layer to prepare the panel of poplar wood appears to have been different for the Mona Lisa, with its own distinctive chemical signature, according to a team of scientists and art historians in France and Britain. Quote from Victor Gonzalez, the study's lead author and chemist at France's top research body, the CNRS, he was someone who loved to experiment, and each of his paintings is completely different technically. So, um, apparently, I went on to say, 
in this case, it's interesting to see that indeed there is a specific technique for the ground layer of the Mona Lisa. Uh, researchers found a rare compound plum on a crite uh, in Leonardo's first layer of paint. The discovery confirmed for the first time uh, what art historians have previously only hypothesized. Uh, um, uh, had a, a hypothesis about that Leonardo most likely used lead oxide, oxidized powder to thicken and help dry his paint as he began working on the portrait that now stares out behind protective glass in the, Lou, the Louvre Museum in Paris. So, um, that's this, they used a a sink on Tron, which uses x-rays. It's a large machine that that uh, sends particles at the speed of light, allowing them to unravel a speck of paint's chemical makeup and plumb on a crite is a byproduct of lead oxide, allowing researchers to say with more certainty that Leonardo used that powder in his paint recipe. According to Gonzalez, that it is a really a fingerprint of his recipe. It is the first time we can actually chemically confirm it. Um, Dutch master Rembrandt uh, is uh, thought to have used a similar recipe when painting in the 17th century, and Gonzalez and other researchers have found uh, plum on a crite in that work also. Uh, he said, it also tells us that those recipes were passed over centuries. It was a very good paint recipe. Uh, Leonardo has thought to have dissolved lead oxidized powder, which has an orange color, in linseed or walnut oil, by heating the mixture to make it thicker, uh, fast-drying paste. Quote, What you will obtain is an oil that has a very nice golden color. It flows more like honey. But the Mona Lisa, said to be said by the Louvre to be a portrait of Lisa Gerardi, the wife of a Florentine silk merchant, and other works by Leonardo, still apparently have other secrets to tell, and they will continue to research the paintings. According to Gonzalez, there are plenty, plenty more things to discover for sure. We are barely scratching the surface. What we are saying is, is just a little brick more of knowledge about Leonardo, uh, Leonardo da Vinci. So, hey, I love science, so stuff like that's right by alley. They're, they're trying to break down the recipes of paint that these great artists and portraits and painters use to make the amazing paintings that uh, you can see today at a nom at well not a nominal fee. I don't know how much it costs to get to the museum. Probably not cheap, but uh, you can see these paintings centuries, centuries old, holding up over time. Pretty amazing stuff. Moving on to entertainment and coffee. As you know, I do like the show Yellowstone, and uh, Cole Hauser, who plays Rip, Rip, uh, is launching his own coffee line. Inspired by his own cowboy roots called Free Rain Coffee. Um, he is uh, launching it. The new brand is meant to be a nod to the rugged spirit of the West and pay tribute to the hard-working cowboys that he grew up around on and off set, according to the statement from the company. There are six blends, each to cater to different tastes, but all have cowboy-inspired names. Uh, for example, Heavy Spur is ideal for sippers uh, who like a lot of caffeine. Uh, Branded has cayenne and cinnamon. Uh, and then uh, America Dirt is Hallowser's personal choice for the dark 100% Arabica blend. Uh, they're being sold in 12-ounce packages of ground or whole beans retailing for $16 and 12-pack of coffee pot pods little coffee pod thingies you put in the coffee makers for $12. Uh, and there are, of course, discounts if you buy more or set up a subscription. And there's also branded drinkware and apparel. Pretty amazing stuff. Uh, the Western influence of the coffee goes beyond aesthetics. The small batch facility is located in San Angelo, Texas, that has been roasting coffee beans for over 25 years before Hauser bought it. So this is like his company. That Yellowstone money must be paying him good to buy a coffee company. Uh, according to the press release, uh, quote, with free reign, we're not only crafting a premium coffee experience, but also paying a heartfelt homage to the American dream. As a nation built on dreams and aspirations, we want to inspire the go-getters, the dreamers, and the believers to fuel their pursuits 
Just as the American dream knows no boundaries, we aim to exceed expectations and create a legacy of our own, one that is deeply connected to our roots and core values that shape us. I'm excited for everyone to finally have their hand on this coffee. So, Cole Hauser, uh, as you may know, was people's 2020 sexiest, sexiest man alive, apparently, or at least he was in the issue, uh, grew up in Santa Barbara and a ranch in Oregon. Uh, he recalled a childhood filled with riding horses and cruising around with cows and all kinds of different animals that we had. Quote, my mom would ring the dinner bell and the horses I used to have, cinnamon, he'd come up and drop his head and I'd just slide down his mane and ride into the house. So I've always been outdoors. So, but he's not the only feller from Yellowstone putting out a product. Um, uh, Gator, the chef, the chef that's on the um, show, uh, Gabriel Gator Gerbu, Gerbu um, he released a cookbook. He was, I guess he is an actual cook, but he released a cookbook called um, um, Gillstone, the official Dutton Ranch cookbook. Uh, it's full of recipes he has made for the cast while filming in Montana and dishes that the on-screen family eats whether it be Rip's fried bread with scrambled eggs and bacon or Beth's cheesy hamburger mac, hamburger mac casserole. Uh, he plays a cook on the show. And he is actually a cook. He cooks for the cast and whatnot. So, and I think his name is actually Gator. He's just like, just call me Gator. Not really an actor, just a cook. So, if you're a big fan of coffee, Yellowstone, and cooking, then you are you should get these, these three things. You should watch Yellowstone, get the cookbook, and check out Rip's Coffee. So, uh, hey, more power to him. I, if, if, if I was getting tons of money, I would probably put out, let's be honest, it'd probably be a whiskey. Let's, I'm not going to pretend I'm going to be fancy. It'd be a whiskey, I think. So, maybe one of these days. If I won the Powerball, I definitely would have. But, unfortunately, everyone will have to wait for Colt's Whiskey. Moving along, folks. Um, I have hit this story at least once, twice, if not every year. But, in Alaska, at the Cat... Uh, the Katmai National Park in Preservation, Alaska, every year they have a fat bear competition where they post pictures of all the bears as they begin to hibernate and you vote on the best fat bear of the week or of the year. And there's a new champion, new champion, a uh, bear named 128 Grazer has been crowned the winner of the 2023 Fat Bear Week, has joined the Hall of Champions, get it, get it, According to a post on Facebook, the gutsy girl grounded the guy with a gut. The Mondo Mountain of a male, 32 Chunk, proved to be a permanent posterior, was worthy of a whopping win. But in the end, Chunk got grazered. Grazer, they said, was a bear with the biggest bear donk a donk. <laughs> received an overwhelming majority of the votes in the final round. 108,321 100, 108, votes to a to a mere 23,134 votes. That is a uh, that is a distinctive win, uh, according to the uh, post. Quote: Let's crown our queen. That's thicker than a boat of oatmeal. One two eight grazer. Long live the queen. Um, one two eight grazer went up against seven other bears to get the coveted title, including one of her own cubs, Bear four two eight. According to the Facebook post, uh, Fat Bear Week is held every year to celebrate the bears of Brooks River in Alaska as they finish up their bulk before they go into hibernation for the winter. For, for the winter, uh, and the winner of this one's contest apparently was for the books. According to officials, Grazer was first found in 2005 when she was just a cub and since has emerged as one of the best anglers at the river known to successfully catch fish on numerous in numerous locations. Uh, she also is a particularly defensive mother who has raised two litter of cubs and is known to confront and attack other bears, even those who are much larger and more dominant than she is. Uh, quote, in summer 2023, many many bears remember her reputation and Grazer maintained a high level of dominance even though she was single. Grazer's combination of skill and toughness makes her one of the Brooks River's most formidable, successful, 
and Adaptable Bears. So, Grazer, 128 Grazer, congratulations, Thick Queen, for being this year's Fat Bear Week champion. Hopefully next year you'll be able to defend, defend your title. Moving along to Taylor Swift, which is like the good Kanye West story I talk about every week. Love, love, love myself some Taylor Swift. Never listened to music, but won a uh, very well, very, very well, well businesswoman. Talk about generating money. Probably has like a, like a, like a, like a cash printer in her own house. But anyways, she released a movie this week, Taylor Swift, The Eras Tour. According to AMC, it generated between 95 and 97 million dollars. Now, just for a, just for a comparison, the all-time opening weekend for a movie was The Joker at $96.2 million. So it could be, depending on when the final numbers come in, the highest opening movie in all of October of all time. Um, apparently 4.8 million people paying $20 a ticket went to go see this movie this uh, past weekend and has generated a ton of money. A ton of money, and you know it's it's the st movies broadcasting today. So when all said and done, could be the largest one, according to one box office analyst. Even if tracking is broken, this is a fantastic opening in a post-pandemic world. Um, now, of all the tickets sold this week, uh, sixty percent were committed in advance, which is an astoundingly high number of tickets sold in advance, and they think this movie will easily be north of $100 million. Like, it, it's the highest pre-sales uh, intelligence, which tracks ticket sales, has ever seen, and uh, it actually released a, night, a day early on Thursday. Um, it, uh, it, was, uh, it was amazing, an amazing amount of money coming in for this concert film. Concert film. Um, the just to the 2011 uh, movie, Justin Bieber, Never Say Never, uh, is the previous highest grossing concert film in the United States at 73 million. It's already higher than that, and rightfully so. I don't like Justin Bieber at all. But anyways, um, pretty, pretty amazing, pretty amazing stuff uh, with, from, out of Taylor Swift. And AMC just, you know, they're just, they're making tons and tons of money. Pretty amazing stuff. The top theater uh, that showed this was AMC Disney Springs in Orlando, which brought in $239,000 so far. Uh, then AMC Lincoln Square at $217,000. Boston Common at $199,000. And then Cinemark had 13.8% of weekend ticket sales of Swift. Regal had 13.2%. It was uh, Taylor Swift movies. And Canada Cineplex was 5.7% of all sales was this movie. So that is, uh, <laughs> that is some pretty, pretty crazy stuff. The Eras Tour smash hit from Taylor Swift. Uh, I'll never see the movie. It's three hours long. Not my thing, but pretty impressive production from Miss Swift. And she's dating a football player. So with that is likely to fall apart and she breaks up with them will probably be even more great music. So, you know, just, just waiting for it to happen. So congratulations, Taylor Swift, on an amazing record-breaking weekend box office opening of her Era Tour concert film. Well, my friends, that just about wraps up this week's Saturday Report with me, Colt, Sebastian, Taylor. Thank you so much for joining me here today. Remember, you can find me on a variety of social media channels like the Twitter, the Facebook, the Instagram, the Counter Social, the Threads, all at Colt S. Taylor. I'm also on Cameo at Colt S. Taylor. Um, go to ColtSebastianTaylor.com for all my Colt Sebastian Taylor updates. And of course, if you are listening to this program, you need to subscribe to the podcast version. Well, you're listening to the podcast version, and you need to subscribe to anchor.fm slash Colt S. Taylor so you can be updated when I post out new weekly episodes. And then finally, once again, be sure to check out Loving 13 Boutique for all of your fashion needs as well as Trixie Ta Trixie's Tavern for all of your dungeon and dragon needs. Links to both these wonderful places are in the post 
below, so do check those out. I think you'll enjoy them. I wouldn't plug them if I didn't think they were quality. So, until next time, my fantastic friends, I'm, of course, your friend, Colt Sebastian Taylor, and I'll see you later.